Wow, we got a big turnout today. I'm impressed. So everybody have a good holiday? Yeah, it's kind of hard to get started. Nothing like doing pathology the you know morning that you guys come back from a nice holiday. So, all right, so we're going to go back to Copenhagen. So this is the classic tour boats. The funny thing is, is they keep the bridges really low. So at high tide, when you go through there, you have to like tilt your head sideways if you're on the end, or you'll bang your head underneath the bridges as you go through the various canals and waterways. But it's a good way to see the city. Copenhagen is an interesting city. It's, you know, a lot of 400-year-old buildings and then interspersed with some really ultra-modern architecture, which is kind of interesting. So this is their opera house, right on the water. Very nice, you know, glass and steel and very, very ultra-modern. And then, of course, you've got your old, you know, government building here, um, you know, castle that the, the king had lived in. And so that was built probably in the 1600s. And so a real juxtaposition of, of old with new. And here, oh man, it didn't lighten up well. This is the new um, main library. So this is kind of the, the country's um, library, kind of like the Library of Congress. And again, it, they call it the black cube. And so it's, it's black glass, and it's a cube, and it's got a big atrium, kind of like Moran, and these are all escalators going up. It's, it's pretty cool inside. What's interesting is, is, again, the juxtaposition of old with new. It's a bunch of musty old stacks and then a bunch of computer terminals. And so, again, a mixture of old and new. And this, this kind of summarizes Copenhagen here, the ubiquitous crane. There's cranes everywhere. I think that's their national bird is the crane. So you see cranes everywhere building, and yet you see the old uh, tower sticking up. So a good mix of, of old with new. So we're going to talk about lens path today. And you know, if you remember five weeks ago, I know it seems like an eternity, but last year when we talked about embryology, since you're in the, the hot seat there, Reese, um, tell me a little bit about the embryology of the lens. What layer does it come from and how does it form? It's ectoderm. Okay, what kind of ectoderm? Surface. Surface. And so it's really important to remember, remember the important parts of the eye, the retina, the pigment epithelium, come from neural ectoderm, whereas the surface ectoderm gives rise to not only the skin, the epithelium of the skin, the epithelium of the conge and the cornea, but it gives rise to the lens itself. So early on in gestation, you'll get this neural ectodermal outpouch, then it'll touch the surface ectoderm and then it'll induce it to thicken, and then you'll get an invagination and so this neural ectoderm forms the, you know, the sensory parts of the eye, but the surface ectoderm eventually pinches off and forms the lens itself. So the lens is, is coming from the surface ectoderm. And when you look at these, these are in um, embryos, I think mice or something. I mean, they're very much like humans at this stage, but they've highlighted it. And here you see the, here you see the pinching off, and here's the surface ectoderm, and then it eventually pinches off and forms the lens. All right, so this just shows it schematically. What's interesting is as the lens begins to form, it's first of all just a round ball. But then the cells in the back will migrate forward. And as they migrate forward, they fill that in. And that's an important point because throughout life, there normally should not be lens epithelial cells along the posterior capsule. They've migrated anteriorly. And when the lens grows throughout life, these cells will go out along the equator uh, no, thank you. This is not an Apple computer, so I really don't think we need new Apple software. So what happens is, is the cells will then grow out on the equator and then fan out, and that's how the lens grows throughout life. So this just shows this in that this is actually a human embryo. You can see the cells have come from the posterior surface, growing anteriorly, fill that circle with the lens fibers themselves. All right, so this is what the lens looks like with a slit lamp, um, something you rarely see at the VA, at least when you're there, which is a nice, clear lens. But you can see as we become older, the lens goes from round to being more of an oblong. So it's more of an oval than it is a circle itself. This is what it looks like in pathology. And let's go a little bit, let's go back one. 
You know, there are several parts of the lens you want to think about, and, and you can put it into different layers. The embryologic nucleus, the fetal nucleus, the adult nucleus, the cortex, the capsule, and then the zonules around it. Uh, Ashley, what kind of stain are we showing here? Okay, look closely at what's taking up a lot, a lot of bright stain there. Uh, Alright, so this is, this is PAS, because what is PAS stain? Uh, basement, basement membrane. So what is the lens capsule? The thickest basement membrane in the body. Alright, so we're number one. Woo -hoo. So the thickest basement membrane in the body is the lens capsule, and you got to remember that the lens capsule is truly a basement membrane. But if you look, the anterior capsule is probably 50% uh, thicker than the posterior capsule. So when you're looking at pathology specimens, you're not quite sure where it came from. The thicker of the two is the anterior capsule. And actually, what are these underneath the anterior capsule? Ones at the thelial cells. cells. And remember, we said there should normally be none posteriorly. So that looks really thick in this big picture, but that's really only about 10 microns thick. So that's all that's between you and vitreous when you're in there with a 40,000 hertz ultrasound machine with suction going full blast. So always be sure that that's all that's between you and disaster. So be really careful around that lens capsule when you're operating. All right, what part are we showing here, Chris? Uh, that's the the equatorial region, or the so-called lens bow. And so as you look right here, when the lens fibers grow throughout life, they come to the equator, and then they fan out. And if you were to see this in three dimensions, they fan out along the edge of the equator. So if the, if the lens were a flying saucer, they're on the edge of that flying saucer, and then they send fibers both anteriorly and posteriorly. Nico, what are we looking at? I'm sorry. Renee, you, you pulled out there, but you're still in order. Renee, sure. what are we looking at here? We're looking at the lens fibers here, uh, the zonular fibers. So zonular see. fibers. So it's important to note, here's the lens, here's the ciliary body, this is a scanning EM. Look at where those zonules go. They go, some of them attach to the ciliary processes, some of them go all the way back here almost to the pars planus, so it's really anchored in tightly. Those zonules really, really hold that lens in place. And so I like to think of the zonules as like the springs on a round trampoline. And so they're the ones that hold the lens in place, but if you look, they anchor way back here, so they can, they can go back all the way from the processes almost to the pars plana, the flatter part of the ciliary body. Nico, what are we showing here? Uh, we're seeing kind of uh, the Y suture, Well, actually, if you look carefully, even in an adult lens, you'll see some variation of a Y suture. So, you know, if you guys want, you know, you'll say, gee, I've not really noticed Y sutures. You know, when you go to clinic today, just take a second and, and somebody nicely dilated, look at their lens and see if you can't find the Y sutures. Why do they form? I think it's like the intersection of um, where kind of cells migrate. Well, it's where their processes come, anteriorly and posteriorly. And so remember, because that lens is more oval than round, those fibers don't come to a complete point because it's not perfectly round. So they come, um, because it's oblong, they will come to a different point and they'll often form a Y. And what's interesting is you can see a, a Y up and down and a Y inverted, depending on, on when you look at the lens itself. And oftentimes, the inverted Y is in front and the, up, the straight up and down Y is in the back. But these kind of denote the nucleus, especially the anterior part of the fetal nucleus and then the beginnings of the adult nucleus. And here you can see the fibers, the lens fibers. And when you look at them, they're shaped almost like a honeycomb, which is interesting. And so the nuclei are at the equator, but those fibers go both anteriorly and posteriorly. Okay. So Tara, what is the, what's in those lens fibers? What are they mostly made of?
Well, they've got a lot of proteins in them. That's what you want to remember. You've got alpha and beta crystalline proteins, and they tend to form certain networks with the proteins. And the reason that they're important is as you get older and older, sometime the proteins in those fibers will clump together and then they'll start cross-linking. And when they do, that's when the lens becomes both harder and less transparent. So as it becomes cloudier, it becomes harder, it becomes a cataract as we, as we age. <coughs> All right, what, uh, sorry, I'm on this slide. Shroff, what are, we, what are we looking at right here? a contact lens and it's a special type of contact lens because what else is going on with this patient actually still behind the pupil. So what's happened to that lens? Yeah, it's dislocated. And note the direction. If this is the left eye, it's dislocated superiorly and temporally. Does that tell you anything? Actually, that's the pattern of lens dislocation that you see in Marfan syndrome. Now, why that is, I have no idea. I mean, gravity pulls down, it doesn't pull up and out. So, why Marfan's dislocates superior temporally, I don't know, but it does. It's very weird. And so, Marfan's tends to dislocate superior temporally, and the zonules give way, it's diffuse zonulopathy. And this is an aphacic contact lens. And this is him. This picture is so old. This is the original Moran Clinic which was in the old building on the A level, which is now, I think, ENT. But in any event, that's when the whole Moran had 10 exam rooms. There was no Moran, Department of Ophthalmology. This is one of our old techs. And this gentleman has got Marfan's. Look at his fingers and his legs and his arms. So that was him, Marfan's. And he wore aphagic lenses for years, and then that nuclear or that lens started to get a little bit more dislocated and there was risk of pupillary block so eventually underwent cataract surgery. So dislocation of the lens is a common thing that you see in Marfan syndrome because Marfan's is a disease where there's um, you know disruption of some of the strength of the fibers and so these people get aortic dissections, they get all kinds of other things that, that are due to the um, problem with the, with the strength of the fibers. So because the zonular fibers are weakened in Marfan's, they tend to get dislocation. This is one, I've never seen one of these. This is another common cause of dislocation. This is homocystinuria. And the only reason I have to show this is because they put it on like OCAPs every other year. And I've never seen one in 30 years, but they exist. And the weird thing is, is in homocystinuria, they dislocate inferior nasal, whereas Marfan's they dislocate superior temporal. Again, why, I have no idea. Becca, what are we seeing here? So lenses can also dislocate anteriorly. In this particular gentleman, it was a trauma. So it's a traumatic dislocation. And so if you have a severe blunt trauma, it's not common, but you can have a lens dislocation in the anterior chamber. Now there's another condition you have to memorize for boards that can cause dislocation of the lens into the anterior chamber. What could that be? It's actually spherophakia. So spherophakia is an interesting disorder where the lens is spherical shaped instead of, of oblong. It's round and it's small. 
So spherophakia, literally sphere-shaped lens. So spherophakia, and they are at increased risk of a spontaneous dislocation anteriorly because these lenses tend to be small and you get the weak zonules and then they can pop anteriorly. Here's a, a, a man. I can't blame the fellows on this one. This is a copy of an old AFIP slide. This is probably 50 years old. But you can see that there is a lens that's spontaneously dislocated into the anterior chamber. All right, now, uh, Chris, this is a younger child with a, a cataract. And I'm not sure why the eye was removed if the child died or not. But and, and this just shows you that the eye is small, as you see in terms of the size. It's only, it's only about 12 millimeters in diameter, very, very small eye. What do you make of the shape of that lens? So, uh, the left one, or so. It's cut in half. I, I, I'm sorry, this is a is normal size right? for the kid, and this is one next to it, just showing the difference. Okay, so it's very round. Okay, so what could a child have that can cause a smaller, rounder lens in addition to maybe some damage to their retina and other things elsewhere in their body? Um, so I think of like the, uh, well, like right now through, through maturity possibly causing problems with the eye, but also just the, uh, all the infectious processes that kids get with Exactly, and what's an infectious process that can give you small, you know, microspherophakia? Rubella. Rubella, exactly. So this is a rubella cataract, and that's important to remember because you may be seeing these more often because that well-known physician um, Jenny McCarthy has, has told people that um, vaccines cause autism, and so therefore a lot of people are not vaccinating their kids, and so you're going to start to see outbreaks of things like measles and rubella as people are not vaccinating. Now, I, I find it interesting that, you know, somebody who listens to Jenny McCarthy, well, maybe they're not sophisticated, but there's a pocket of people in Park City, you know, very intelligent, very bright people who are not vaccinating their kids now. And so you're gonna see clusters of these, uh, you know, infectious diseases that we thought were wiped out coming back. And so you may actually see rubella and it can cause this microspherophakia. And the other thing that's weird about rubella is, is that you get retention of these uh, rubella, you get virus fibers even in these lens nuclei. So even after they've had the virus, there still be viral particles there within the lens itself. So very, very interesting entity. All right, so we're gonna talk about cataracts. So, so Lee, what kind of cataract are we looking at here? <clears throat> well, it, it polar means kind of in the anterior, posterior center. This is bigger than just that. What part of the lens is this taking up? Looks like it could be anterior. That is actually the entire field nucleus. And so this is a congenital nuclear cataract. And what's interesting also is, is with this one, there's kind of the male symbol, there's the female sy symbol. So I call this the Prince cataract, you know? You know when Prince was a male-female symbol? Come on, you guys aren't that young. So. This is a Prince cataract. So this is a, I shouldn't say that now because he died this year, so that's really the, the late Prince. And so this is a congenital cataract involving the lens nucleus. So it's involving the center of the nucleus, the fetal nucleus, right here. And this woman is interesting. She never had it removed. She's, she's like 70. And her vision in that eye is count fingers. And yet she functions through in life. She's been functioning with this since she was a child. And this is just showing you a different view. Here's the edge of the pupil dilated here. And this is a slip beam. I was trying to show this on here. See how that faint opacity is in the center of the nucleus. Again, in the fetal nucleus. So congenital um, nuclear cataract in the very, very center. So they're very discrete, very, very central nuclear opacity. So it's a different general, patient though, right? What's that? That's a different patient. This is a different patient. Yep, another patient. All right. 
What do we see in here? Back to vectories. Um, so it's a white lens, and then it looks like there's a rectal detachment. I believe it or not, this is just what you normally see, and you know, in an eye globe when it's been cut out. This is just showing you kind of a, a, a dense, dense cataract from an eye that's been cut sagittally. Okay, so now we're looking, this is called the Miyake apple view. So Miyake's a guy in Japan who figured out if you cut an eye in half and glue it to a slide, you can actually look at the inside at the same time as you're working, you know, anterior or so look posterior. So this is as if you're sitting on the optic nerve looking out. And so you can see, here's the ciliary body and then the zonules are here. And so you can see right here, this is a nuclear cataract. And so nuclear is the most common type of cataracts we see in an adult. So an adult nuclear cataract. And this is the ultimate nuclear cataract. Um, what do we call this, Ashley? Um, brunescent. Brunescent means brown-like. And so you can have a brunescent cataract. You can even get, I don't see them in, in the first world, but in the third world, you can even get cataracts that all, almost turn black. They're so hard. So this is a brunescent, a brown-like cataract. And that's a dense, 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 that's a nucleus. The um, lens nucleus gets so big it takes up the entire, um, you know, the entire cataract itself. And then, you know, people often say, well, what does a cataract look like in histopath? We usually don't do the path of, of cataracts that are removed because you don't really see anything. I mean, here's the nucleus and here's the cortex. You could say, well, yeah, that's kind of denser, it's taking up more stain, but to be honest, I, I couldn't look at this pathology and say, is that a trace nuclear or a three plus nucleus? They all look the same pathologically. So it's really hard to tell anything on the pathology of a nuclear cataract. Chris, what do we see in here? Uh, cortical cataracts. Cortical cataracts. You see the classic wedge pie-shaped cataract. So they come to a point in the center and then they have this wedge or this pie shape. So these are the cortical cataracts and then Here's one posteriorly. You can kind of see the you know, little wedges there of the, of the cortical cataract. And what happens to the fibers that causes a cortical cataract? Uh, they <coughs> so they get uh, fluid filled. Exactly. So so you get liquefaction. So you actually get fluid in there. And so. It's kind of fun. Um, next time you guys are with me, I'll show you. When you have a, a someone with really distinct cortical spokes, when you go to start the capsule rexus, if you just push the lens, uh, push on the capsule, it, those bubbles will just go away. So it just liquefies. And so there's these little liquefaction bubbles all over here that, that are really um, the sign of a cortical cataract. And this shows you severe liquefaction of the, of the uh, cortex. So you've got these fibers broken up, little globules, and then you've got just fluid, basically, liquefaction in there as the cortex breaks down. Renee, what do we see in here? Sunny side up. This looks like a hypermature, likely a Morgagnian cataract. Okay, and what causes Morgagnian cataracts? What causes that appearance? It's because of the liquef liquefaction of the cortex, and so the nucleus starts to drops down within the bag. Exactly. So this, this is, a, is an example where the cortex completely liquefies. And so it's basically just a bag of liquid. And then what happens is, is that dense nucleus in the center drops down. And so you'll see these. That nucleus will be sinking down. And instead of the capsule being really tense, like you see in an in intermescent white cataract, you'll actually see little wrinkles in the cataract. because. As that liquid leaks out, the cataract actually shrinks a little bit in the capsule bag. And as Renee said, it's got the sunny side up look to it. So this is the Morgagnian sunny side up cataract. And there you see one that was actually removed. Here's the dense nucleus. Here's the what's left of the capsule. And you see there's virtually no cortex in there. It's all completely liquefied. Nico, what are we seeing here? So uh, I'm seeing a. Uh, white issue pacification in the lens. Um, hard to say which part, but maybe this is the posterior subcapsular, etc. Yeah, if you look right here, look, there's the anterior surface of the lens right there. You can see we're focused really deep. So this is actually what we call a posterior subcapsular, PSC. 
And here it is on retroillumination. So these really show up well on retroillumination. There's a higher power. This is a student who volunteered in my lab this summer. He said, oh, someone told me I had a cataract once. So we dilated him and looked at him. And sure enough, PSC cataract. And they'll show you a more diffuse one. And so these show up best on retroillumination. So when you look at these, you put that beam straight on, move it to the temporal side of the pupil, and then look at the orange light coming back. And you'll see these outlined posteriorly. What's the pathology characterized by? There's like vital or bladder cells. Exactly. So I guess that the proper ostrium would be vedal, W-E-V-L, vedal cells. And so you get these very, they call them bladder cells, and they're very swollen. Now the other thing, this is the posterior capsule, by the way. This picture's upside down. Next year I'll ask you if that's right side up or upside down, see if you remember it. But this is actually the posterior capsule, and you can see we've had migration of nuclei along the posterior capsule, and then they become very swollen like bladders. There's the nuclei in the center. And so this, this is what we see characteristically in the posterior subcapsular. Now, they always love asking this, um, Tara, what's a differential diagnosis for causes of a posterior subcapsular cataract? Okay, so um, cortical steroids. Trauma. Trauma? Um, it can happen in F2. One other main area. Um, main area? Main area that can cause PSCs. Um, diabetes. Diabetes can, oh, another one. Trauma. Ischemia? Uh, not really. kind of a main area that can cause PSCs. Inflammation. And so you see these often in uveitis. You see these in like, especially like people with intermediate uveitis, so-called pars planitis, where you get a lot of inflammation, you will get these PSC cataracts. And so some of it can come from the inflammation, some of it can come from the treatment of the inflammation, which is the cortical steroids that the Tara had said right at first. So cortical steroids are a common cause of these diabetes, inflammation, and then some of the less common causes. So PSCs are one where we can actually find a particular cause. Now these can also be due to aging, but oftentimes they come on earlier and they come on secondary to other things. All right, uh, back up, what do we see in here? What, what part of the lens are we looking at at this point? It looks like there's, is that slavery part of the top? That's actually part of that, that's some denuded iris at the top, okay? So what part of the lens are we looking at here? This is the anterior part. So this is the iris here, this is the anterior part. Look, there's a capsule completely intact, and then underneath the capsule, you see this area of opacity. So this is called an anterior subcapsular. So believe it or not, you can get anterior subcapsulars just like you get posterior subcapsulars. These are a little bit different because these are caused by those anterior lens epithelial cells undergoing a metaplasia, meaning they change their characteristic and they become fibrous. And so anterior lens epithelial cells can actually undergo fibrous metaplasia. This can be congenital, it can be due to an insult. Now, a good example of that is when you guys are looking at somebody who had cataract surgery 10 years ago with a beautiful rexus, and they're dilated, look at them, and what do you see? You see the edge of the anterior capsule look kind of white or it'll even constrict, it'll cause what's called phimosis. That's anterior fibrous metaplasia of the anterior lens epithelial cell. So you can see that every day in clinic. But this is an anterior subcapsular cataract, which is actually not very common. And here's what it looks like. Boy, bonus points if you can name this stain. Anybody? Trichrome. Trichrome, ah, very good, is that Ashley? 
Maybe. Sorry, I'm under the lights here, so I can, uh, you guys are like just outlines. And I'm like trying to see who's, who's here. So this is actually a trichrome stain, and the reason it's very interesting is it stains um, fibrous type tissue, collagen, blue. And so you can see right here, this is fibrous metaplasia, those anterior lens of the cells start laying down fibrosis, and that capsule's still intact. And the normal cortex is down here, and you get this focal area, this anterior fibrous metaplasia. So anterior subcapsular cataracts can be congenital, they can be post-traumatic. Um, other entities are very weird, obscure um, syndromes. Don't worry. Well, they may show up once in a while, but don't waste neurons at this point memorizing them. What are we seeing here, Chris? Uh, looks like a Eye. Um, Actually, this is a normal eye. It's just been cut in, cut sagittally, and these are the. This is the central collapse. It's been cut off at the limbus on both sides, and this is the center. So it looks like there's a, a white lens there. Uh, looks like it's mostly anterior. What's the shape of that? Uh, it's bone or horseshoe. Yeah, it's a kind of a horseshoe shape, and, and if we have a cut that went. Um, all the way around. Believe it or not, this would go all the way around, almost like a ring. This is called a summering's ring, and, and it's not summer like the season. Summerings was a was a pathologist. S O E M M E R I N G S. Summerings. So this is called a summering's ring. These are initially seen as uh, people would have trauma. So if you had a traumatic rupture of the lens. And the lens nucleus gets extruded, but you have some cortex left in the periphery. Remember at the, at the fornix there, you've got all those little lens epithelial cells, and they can grow. And so you end up with, this is a traumatic summering's ring cataract. But more commonly, we see that lead. What are we looking at here? Yeah, it's a summering dream, but what's this this patient hasn't had trauma and what have they had? Uh, um, cataract surgery. surgery. So believe it or not, there's an IOL buried in here. They've also had glaucoma surgery. There's a um, a uh, tube in the anterior chamber. But you can see that the lens implant is here and you see this, this proliferation. And so Initially, people were doing um, what we call intracapsular cataract surgeries, meaning they would dissolve the zonules and yank the whole lens out, and then give the patient thick coke bottom glasses, they fake spectacles. But as intraocular lenses were invented, and people started going now to extracapsular surgery. So what you did was you would extrude the nucleus, and then you'd suction out as much cortex as you could, but you know without a, a Capsulorexis and phaco, you really couldn't get that all out, so there'd be lots of cortex left in the fornix, but there'd be lots of lens epithelial cells left, and as they grew, we saw summering during very commonly in the early extracapsular surgeries with posterior chamber IOL. So this is circa 1982-83. And so you see, it was very common to see this summering during proliferation. And even in more modern surgery, this is now maybe 1990s, here's a three-piece IOL in the capsular bag. This patient had phaco. You could still see a peripheral summering ring, these lens epithelial cells growing. And this is what it looks like in cross-section. It literally looks like a dumbbell or a donut. So if you take a donut or cut it in half, it looks like a dumbbell. You've got proliferation of cortical material here in the fornix on both sides but in the center, it's still clear. All right, so Lee, a chance to redeem yourself. What stain is this? Trichrome. Trichrome, very good. So here's the anterior capsule. Look how thick that is compared to the posterior capsule. So you see it's twice as thick. And they will almost fuse together at the edge of where the capsule rexus was. And here's proliferative cortex in the fornix. So this is what a summary thing looks like pathologically. Alright, back to Reese. What are we seeing here? Um, looks like there's maybe exfoliated material on the iris. 
margin and then on the anterior lens capsule. Okay, so this is a classic picture of exfoliation syndrome. Now, people used to call this exfoliation of the lens capsule. And it's not so much that, that the lens capsule exfoliates, it's that exfoliative material gets deposited on the lens capsule. And the reason why you see this pattern is? Uh, where the pupil normally runs, the yeah. iris normally runs. So the pupil goes back and forth almost like a windshield wiper. So as your pupil goes in and out, it kind of sweeps that material more to the center, more to the periphery. And so when you look at a lens with exfoliation syndrome, it will often have a clear zone here where the pupil normally goes back and forth. So this is a classic picture of exfoliation syndrome. And here you can see the so-called scalloped edge. Now this is blatant. Now oftentimes when you see these in Crandall's clinic, it's much more subtle than that. You maybe will see a little ruffle at the edge of the pupil. You see the pupil maybe not dilating quite so well. So not quite as dramatic as this, but here's a nice dramatic scalloped edge that's set material on the lens capsule. And then you can see on retroillumination, Again, that nice scalloped edge. So this is blatant exfoliation syndrome. Now, um, Ashley, what is this showing? Iron filings. The iron filings. So when you were a kid, did you ever take a magnet and put it on those scrapings of iron and it would stand up on there? So this is what they call the iron filing pattern. So when you look at pathologically, here's the lens capsule, here's lens of the cells underneath, and this is the anterior capsule. Here you see the exfoliation on the anterior lens capsule. So, what is the importance of exfoliation to a cataract surgeon? Uh, it weakens the nodules. Okay, in what ways? Um, there's more than one way. Well, it's a triple threat. And so, it does weaken the zonules, but it weakens the zonules by where it deposits. And so, this exfoliated material can deposit anteriorly where the zonules insert to the lens <coughs> capsule. So they make that insertion weak. They deposit on the zonules themselves, which makes them more brittle. And then even posteriorly, you forget this stuff can be deposited posteriorly on the ciliary body, where the zonules insert to the ciliary body. So it weakens them in three different places. So when you're a cataract surgeon, not only does the pupil dilate poorly, the capsule is more brittle too, so it's a little bit more brittle, but the zonules are weaker, so you gotta be really careful. And the reason that that's important here in Utah, we see tons of exfoliation in Utah. Uh, Chris, why is that? Uh, genetic predisposition. Yeah, so what, what populations tend to have more exfoliation? Uh, so, Caucasians, but there's a subgroup finish. Yeah, even just Scandinavian in general, and even northern Germany. And so, where do a lot of you know people's families from Utah come from? That area. The Yashur area, you know, Sweden and, and Norway and Denmark. Yeah, sure, you betcha. <laughs> and so, where do you see a lot of exfoliation? It's interesting. In the U.S., you see it in Minnesota, and you see it in Utah. And so, that's where Scandinavian populations have come. And so, you see very commonly exfoliation. You may not necessarily see this in like Alabama, but you see this more frequently in um, people of Northern European ancestry. And so we see tons of exfoliation here in Utah. All right, boy, this is kind of subtle. Renee. So here's our anterior second photograph. I don't know if it's the right eye or the left eye, but tension, the patient definitely has scroll of that capsule. What causes that? Uh, true exfoliation. True exfoliation. So we had to call it true exfoliation to differentiate from the pseudo exfoliation or exfoliation sensor. So this is truly where the lens capsule has split. Now this was just a normal, you know, 90 year old lady with no real history. What have we historically seen true exfoliation in? Well, usually in patients who are like glass blowers who have like a lot of heat. Yeah, people exposed to heat or infrared heat especially. So glass blowers, people used to work at, at steel blast furnaces. You know, nowadays it's mostly automated, but there used to be people who would open the things up and push stuff in there and this, you know, hot stuff would come out at them. Glass blowers especially. And so you would get a very brittle anterior capsule and it would actually scroll 
And so this is, uh, Sam Maska gave me this picture. This is actually intraoperative. And you can see that little scroll of that anterior capsule curled up. So it's interesting. He was going to do a rexus and realize that that's not the entire anterior capsule. Sam's a good observer, so he took a nice picture of this. And he sent me the capsule, which was fun. We actually put this in. You know how they do that INET? It's the Academy's little magazine that comes out every, every month. And they put interesting stuff on the cover. So we got an INET cover with this. And so this is the anterior capsule. And here is, there's lens of the cells. And there it is. And it's literally splitting in the capsule itself. So you get splitting of the capsule. So you truly get an exfoliation, a true exfoliation, a true splitting of the capsule. And there you can see, there's the lens epithelial cells, there's the capsule, there's the split. So true exfoliation. Uh, Nico, what do we see in here? So this is an external photograph of the uh, left eye. Um, there's a lot of projection uh, of the content. I uh, um, really can't see iris. Um, there's like quite a pacification. Yeah, so not only is that corneo pacified, that cornea is pretty cloudy, but there's almost like some stuff here, some whitish stuff in the anterior chamber if you look at it. Now, this is a Nevada rancher. I've been hurting like crazy for the last week because, you know, Nevada ranchers never come in right away. Well, how long have you not been seeing a while out of that eye? Oh, it's been a while. Any history of trauma? Well, I've been kicked by horses a lot, you know. And I went, like, more than one time? Oh, yeah, yeah, all the time. So, so it's kind of got that, you know, kicked in the horse, you know, um, brain too. So um, you see this pressure's 50, 5 0. What could this be? I think about fake antigenic glaucoma. Not antigenic. Well, yeah, it could be antigenic if the lens has been ruptured or not. What else could it be? What if the lens capsule's completely intact? And if it's intact, I would think about fake glaucoma. Exactly. So there's a, an entity called fake lytic glaucoma. It's really weird because lytic means splitting, and so it's not. Nothing's really split, but what happens is, is in this phacolytic glaucoma, the lens liquefies. So this can be from an old trauma, but it's just from a long-standing, intumescent, liquefied lens. And in fact, it liquefies so much the proteins leak through the intact lens capsule in the anterior chamber. And when they are uh, leaking into the anterior chamber, they induce an inflammatory cell reaction of these cells. What kind of cells are these? Macrophages. Exactly. So they're macrophages. So again, with you put an English accent, it sounds intelligent, macrophages. And in fact, the eyes are often enlarged, they often measure two centimeters. And so you see these macrophages, and look how big they are. I mean, that's a normal macrophage right there. Look, they're just totally engorged, and so they try to eat up this pigment. And as a result, these engorged macrophages, not pigment, uh, protein. So these engorged macrophages and the protein clog up the trabecular meshwork, and so you get a severe glaucoma. It's called phacolytic glaucoma. What do we see in right here, Tara? Optic capture here, you can start to see the IOL through that thin um, iris. It's really been thin. There's optic capture, and then there's all this white stuff in here. And this eye has high pressure, they've got chronic uveitis. What's this condition called? Well, it could be if you had hyphema, it could be an UG syndrome, exactly. You guys call coma hyphema, but this is an entity where you get inflammation and then secondary glaucoma from reaction to leftover cortex. And so the setting here usually is there's been a capsular back tear, they haven't cleaned up the cortex well, they tried to put an implant in the sulcus, they got optic capture, but you get this, it's called a phacotoxic uveitis. So it's due to inflammation from leftover cortical material in there. And so you see these not uncommonly, capsular bag tear, cortex left in there, difficult to control glaucoma, difficult to control UVI. You have to clean everything out to get rid of that. All right, uh, Shrav, what are we seeing here? Um, it's a photograph of like a 
Exactly. And in fact, not only are those erratic precipitates we abbreviate as KP, but look at the size of them. They're, they're kind of big and even greasy looking. What do they call these? Mutton fat KPs. And so what's that indicative of? It, it's usually due to an inflammation, and in fact, it's indicative of a granulomatous inflammation. So those big mutton fat KPs, big greasy fat KPs, are usually a sign of a granulomatous type inflammation. And this eye was eventually nucleated, and here you can see an organized um, hypopion. And here's the pupil here, and look at this. There's a ring of this inflammatory material surrounding and involving the lens capsule, so we call that cyclic, meaning in the space of the ciliary body. So what other inflammatory entity can you get involving the lens? Exactly. So the proper word you need to remember now is phacoantigenic uveitis, meaning you get an autoimmune reaction to some of the proteins in the lens. They used to call it, um, what? Actually, it used to be called phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis. It was, you know, again, it was one of those misnomers. It wasn't anaphylactic. There was no IgE involved in this. But um, you didn't, this was reported all the time in like the 1920s. Believe it or not, people were doing crude extra caps in the 1920s. They were going in there, tearing off the capsule, and then kind of flushing out the lens. And then, of course, as I said, people went to intracaps for about 30 years where you remove the whole lens and the lens capsule, so this disease disappeared. Well, in the early 80s, people started doing extra caps again, where you would do a counter capsulotomy, you'd try to you know, force out the nucleus, suction out the cortex. And there was a resurgence of phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis because we were leaving behind lots and lots of cortex. So you would trigger an immune reaction to it. And the only reason I know all of this is there was a swarmy, dark-haired guy with a mustache in Dave Apple's lab that wrote up the first case that had been reported in like 30 years. And so this is indeed that case. We see this very rarely. I think I've seen about two or three of these since then. Why? Because we now do capsulotomies with a round rexus, so it's totally intact, and we're better at sucking out the cortex so there's not a whole lot left over. And so this is actually a reaction to the lens cortical material, and it's, you can also occur due to trauma. And so again, this guy literally got kicked by a horse. And, yes? So the difference between that and is the toxic, um, is it a similar kind of reaction? It's, it's a similar reaction, but fecal toxic is actually due to the cortex itself causing inflammation. It's not granulomatous and it's not antigenic induced, but it's the same idea. Here's an eye, this gentleman lost this eye. Here's what's left of his lens, it's ruptured here, and then you've got this big inflammatory cell reaction around it. So traumatically ruptured lenses will give you this also. And here's pathology here, I know it's hard to tell where we're looking at here, but believe it or not, this is the lens capsule here. This is the cornea up here, that's what's left of iris, cellular body. And you can see there's some lens cortex here there's capsular bag and you just see this inflammation and it's a zonal inflammation. Remember when we talked about different granulomatous inflammations? And so you will often see um, giant cells, epithelial cells, macrophages here munching up that cortex. And then around that you'll have a zone of some lymphocytes around it. So this is the so-called phacoanaphylaxis or now they call it phacoantigenic uveitis is the proper word. And there's a lens capsule. It's hard to see. There's some giant cells here, some macrophages. Did I have one here? I did. There's a giant cell sitting on the lens capsule, munching up that stuff. And so this can occur in a traumatically ruptured lens, but also in a very badly done surgery where there's lots and lots and lots of cortex left over. Now, people have argued about what triggers this immune reaction, and initially in the 1920s, when they were describing this, you would do cataract surgery in one eye, they would get this. You would do it in the other eye, no matter how good you did the surgery, they'd still get an inflammation. So there's some kind of an immune component to this that we don't understand. But as we've gotten better at doing cataract surgery, I'm just not seeing this anymore. Okay, and there's, this almost looks like the 
fourth one that you have above the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. This is actually again in Copenhagen. So next week, you guys get a reprieve because next week we're going to talk about Iowa Islands. And there's really nothing about Iowa Islands in your BCSC books, so you get a reprieve. But we're going to talk about history. We're not going to talk about anything you guys use now. We're going to talk about the history of Iowa Islands because I think it's important to understand how we got where we are now. And I'll often have you know residents and students will come up and say, oh, why don't you do this? You know, it's like, you know, the light bulb lights up and you have this brilliant idea and you say, well, it was done 35 years ago. That didn't work. And so it's kind of nice to get a little bit of a history. So next week, history of Iowa, you get a week off. Then we go back to glaucoma after that.